Hey there, it's Antrice, and welcome to another episode of the Savvy Painter Podcast. The Savvy Painter Podcast is the antidote to an uninspiring job. Let's face it, even if you love your job, there are days when you'd just rather be in your studio painting. I know what that feels like. Years ago, when I art directed video games at Disney, even when it was a job that I loved, there were plenty of days, weeks even, when I'd wish I could just lock myself in my studio and work on my own paintings. I learned to see my job for what it was, my personal patron and a stepping stone to get me where I was meant to be. So whether you love your job and just need a boost to get you over the hump, or if you have the boss from hell and feel like it's sucking the life out of you, Savvy Painter is here to help you reconnect with your creative self, to inspire you by connecting you with other artists who work as hard as you do and show you that you are not alone. Every Thursday, I bring you stories from artists like Harry Stushinoff, Deborah Paris, Steve Deleuze, and Peggy Curl Roberts, artists who struggled with when or if to quit their day job. Learn how Harry stayed engaged with his art while working full time. Discover what Steve did to protect his creative energy. There is no single way to solve the challenge. You can listen to different approaches and hear what each artist needed to have in place before they dove into painting full time. Want to stay even more connected? Join the Savvy Painter email list to get weekly updates and free guides. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. When you join the email list, pick up your free copy of Essential Tips for Artists, a collection of inspiring quotes and practical tips from interviews on Savvy Painter. Just go to SavvyPainter.com forward slash subscribe. Maria Brophy is my guest today. Maria has been a business consultant to creative entrepreneurs since 2009, and she's been an art agent to her husband, Drew Brophy, for over 15 years. Her latest book, Art, Money, and Success, incorporates the success strategies she's used to bring Drew's art to the masses through art licensing, collaborations, and non-conventional business deals. Please enjoy this conversation with Maria Brophy. Maria, thank you so much for being on the Savvy Painter podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you. I wanted to talk to you because you sort of are the manager for your husband's art business. Is that a, a, the correct way to characterize what you do? Yes, absolutely. I've been managing his artworks for about, well, for over 15 years. So I, you could say I'm his agent, I'm his manager, and I'm his partner. Perfect. And you have just published a book called Art, Money, Success. So I wanted to talk about your new book and talk about some of the experiences that you have had over the 15 years of managing your husband's art business. So I'm kind of curious what, you know, just as the, the sort of foundation, what are some of the things that you learned when you started working with your husband and, and managing his art business, what are some of the things that you noticed were sort of surprising or particularly you didn't expect that to be a thing? Oh boy, this is such a good question because well, there were a couple of things. One was I learned really quickly that I didn't know anything about the art business <laughs> and that there was so much to learn and so much to do. The other thing was I learned that I was actually very surprised to learn something that kind of shook me up. And that is when, when I started working with Drew, I said, look, I really want to connect with some of your art heroes, people you've looked up to so that maybe we can learn from them because we there was no there weren't any blogs to learn from back then. There were, there were no resources like there are now. So we made a phone call to a guy that Drew had admired, a gentleman, a very successful artist. What we found out, not just with this one artist, but, but many after him, was that the people that, you, that we were looking up to and looking for answers from were actually weren't as successful as they appeared to be. Mm. And it really burst our bubbles because we had this idea of where we wanted to go with Drew's art. This We had this grand vision of what we wanted the art to represent and how we wanted people to see it and how much money we were going to make. And, you know, just all those things that you dream about. And we were using these artists as kind of like a beacon of light to go, OK, we want to be like him. But then when we got to know the 
the person really well, we found out that it wasn't what it seemed. That the emperor had no clothes? Exactly. Oh, my gosh. And it was, I'll tell you what, it was kind of depressing. Well, my husband, for Drew especially, it was depressing for him because he said, I can't believe it. All my art heroes are are not what I thought they were. And, you know, I mentioned this because it was something that made us realize that we just had to figure stuff out on our own in a way that was going to work for us. And we just did. I mean, we had to plow through it. it. It was a hard lesson to learn, really. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I think I think the hardest thing to learn is that that we all want that secret button, that secret sauce that somebody else knows what it is. And all you have to do is get the recipe and you're done. But oftentimes, it doesn't quite work out that way. I'm curious. Well, there's one thing that you said that I just kind of want to highlight because I think it's really important. This is something that I I talk about with with artists that I work with. But it's something that I think is is just completely glossed over and overlooked. And maybe you don't even notice how powerful it is. But when you were talking about you and your husband had this vision of how you wanted your art to be, and you talked about a a specific number that you guys had, I think most artists don't have that. They just have this vague idea of either making enough to survive or making money, but there's not a number attached to it. Yes, that is a problem. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, it's really hard to get there. It's like getting in your car and pulling out of your driveway and going, hmm, I'm just going to keep driving around until I end up somewhere because I don't know where I'm going. You really have to know what you want. And that's the first chapter of my book is knowing what you want and that's how you're going to get it. And if you don't know what you want, there are ways to figure it out. Because a lot of people will say, well, gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I don't know what I want. And what I say to that is, you actually do know what you want deep down inside. But you have been trained by society, by your parents, by your teachers, by your professors, you've been trained that what you want isn't adequate or realistic or right. And so you got in the habit at a very young age to push what you want aside and to do things that everybody else wants you to do. So if you can tap into that, if you can take the time, you know, if you meditate, that's a great way to do it. If you're not a meditator, another great way to do it is take walks every day. <laughs> leave your leave your phone at home. I do this all the time. I take a walk. I do not take my phone with me. I don't take anything with me but me. And I will just think and I'll look around and enjoy the nature around me. And and sometimes I'll take a question with me. And sometimes it's that. What do I want to happen this week? Mm -hmm. And I'll think about that. But for somebody who doesn't know what they want for their life, maybe they can start with, well, what do I want? And you start with one seed of an idea and then you can grow on that. You can you can expand upon that and allow yourself to dream about it and and think about it. And that's where you start. Yeah, I think that's that's interesting, because as you were describing that, I was thinking I when I go on my walks, I'm usually listening to a book or a podcast or something. So it's sort of like my learning time. But I'm really interested in sort of training or expanding my abilities to problem solve mentally, just I'm more of a and I think artists tend to be this way. We're more of like a physical or visual or making I think we t we have a tendency to learn things by physically doing them or working them out. So it's just another tool that I'm learning to develop is just to mentally figure it out. I don't know if that's too abstract to get. <laughs> no. But it's really interesting to think about incorporating that, you know, when you said take one idea and kind of use that as your your fodder while you're walking as you're trying to figure things out. And I love the idea that I mean, I think it's it's absolutely true that you have to know what you want. And then, you know, the way I put it is you can sort of backwards engineer it or just figure out how to 
make that happen. Some people, if you try to go through, it's sometimes like the intuition is to go from A to Z. But when you don't actually know the alphabet, sometimes it's easier to start from Z and go, okay, how would I have gotten there? What's what's the step immediately before that? Okay, and then how would I have gotten there? And what's the immediate step before that? And that's just my own personal, what would you call it? My own experience, my own current theory that is subject to change as I get more information. So I'm curious, once an artist decides what they want, how did you and, and Drew work that out once you figured that out? Well, what you want is constantly changing, right? Because once you achieve that thing that you want, then you're going to replace that with something new because you've achieved it or you've gotten it. Mm -hmm. But how do you get to that point of getting getting what you want when you have no idea how you're going to do it? So first of all, you have to trust. You have to be open to trusting that if you're committed to it, this thing that you want, that resources and people will come to you if you are open to it. Here's what it looks like to not be open to it, okay? Somebody might be listening and saying, I don't understand what she's saying. So I'm going to clarify this a little bit. Let's say you have a full-time job as an engineer, but you really want to be a a full-time artist. And it seems impossible. To, and I'm, I know a guy that went through this. So I'm thinking of him as I'm telling this story, but it seems impossible to think that you could leave your engineer job because, well, you've got children and you've got a mortgage and how irresponsible would that be? And you're locked in. You're literally imprisoned by this job, but all you want to do is this other thing, and that is to create art and be a full-time artist. Well, first, you know what you want. You want to be a full-time artist. Think about what does that look like? What do you want to be known for? What do you want every day to look like? Mm-hmm. Who do you want your collectors to be? What kind of artist do you want to be? Like, just sort of like daydream about it, but write it down. Write this stuff down as if it's a plan. And then the other details will work themselves out, even if it seems impossible. So, what this engineer guy did, who was in this position, when I was helping him out a couple of years ago, he came to me for advice. And I said, well, look, why don't you do this? You're, you're already doing your art all weekend and you're selling a little bit here and there. So you're already got a little bit art income. Why don't you ask your employer if you can cut back to four days a week and do that for a year? And then you'll get a taste of being a full time artist 20 percent of the time. Right. And one day a week. And he said, oh, no, they'd never let me do that. My, my boss would never allow that. And I said, well. You don't know until you try. Well, sure enough, he emailed me a couple of weeks later and said, you won't believe this. They said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it started with him knowing what he wants. And that now, a couple of years later, he actually did end up leaving that engineering job. And he's a full-time artist and he's doing, he's doing well. He's happy. But you don't have to know how something's going to materialize. You just have to first know what it is that you want and then lean into it. Just keep leaning into it, chipping away at it. Yeah, that's a, such a common problem, whether or, or challenge, I guess, regardless of what it is. I get these emails all the time from people who are trying to transition from a full-time job into painting full-time. But, you know, it's scary, especially when you have this person was an engineer. I worked in video games. There's, you know, like all these, you have a very stable income, you have the ability to move up in that company, probably, hopefully, (laughs) benefits, everything. And then walking away from that was, for me, that was the most terrifying thing I've ever done. Because you go from the known into the unknown. So what are some of the ways that you recommend people? That's one really good tip is to, you know, say like, okay, can I, can I try it on for size, you know, 20% of the time and maybe even have the goal of, can I, (laughs) can I make that day pay for itself? You know, if you need to sort of validate that, that you can eventually make a living at this. But what are some of the other tips that you have or what are what would be some markers that you would suggest for when somebody would be ready to make that transition into a full-time painting? Well, it's really important that you accept the idea that money is a part of the equation 
And I, I only say that because I know a lot of artists that say, well, money is not important to me, but it really has to be important to you if it's going to be your full time gig, because how else are you going to make it unless you have someone supporting you? And some mm-hmm. people are very fortunate. Some people are very fortunate and they have that. And and that's awesome. But for the people who want to go from a full time job Like, I mean, I actually did that. I had a very good job in the insurance industry. And I'll tell you how I transitioned. I worked with Drew on the weekends and evenings, helping him while I went to my full-time job during the day. And I thought about quitting for five years before I actually got the guts to do it. (laughs) (laughs) I hate to admit that. I hate to admit it. That's totally rational. I think you'd be crazy if you didn't. It took me like three years to actually pull the trigger. And there was like a full year where I had told a couple people because I thought it would make me more, you know, when you tell people you're going to do stuff, it it sort of gives you the incentive to follow through. And I told them and I still waited another year. And even though I had people asking me, hey, are you going to do it? Is is it going to be this month? I still waited another full year before I actually pulled the trigger. Because it's scary. It's like going bungee jumping. Like, it sounds like a great idea until you're standing there and they're like telling you to jump. And then you're like, hmm, this is so permanent. <laughs> <laughs> it's so scary. But I did the same thing. I, I did the same thing I had re- recommended to the engineer. I actually, my last year of working there, I had convinced my boss to let me take a pay cut and to cut back to four days a week. So then I was I was really leaning into it. And then one day I finally just gave my notice and I quit and it was so scary. And I I had called a friend who was a writer and she had done a similar thing a couple of years before. And she said, Maria, I know it's scary, but when I quit my job to be a full time writer, she said, I never regretted it a day of it and you're not going to regret it. And she was right. I mean, and I'm I'm not going to sugarcoat this, that first year was really rough because we didn't really have money saved up. We had a baby. We actually didn't have money saved up. We should have, but we didn't. But the good thing about it, it was do or die. Mm -hmm. There was no plan B because I had just left my plan B. So we had to make it work. And that's where you really have to get resourceful. And that's where a lot of the things that I write about in my book, all these business techniques, techniques to make money, that's when it became critical. And that's when we became better business people because we had to. Mm -hmm. What were some of the lessons that you learned that year? What were some of the key things that you learned about being better business people? I learned one of the hardest lessons. So, and this was so depressing. I, so imagine I just quit a job where I was making incredibly good money to start out making almost nothing, right? Working with Drew. And we had built up this wholesale line of products with Drew's art on them. It was stickers, t-shirts, and small paper prints. And we had a couple employees that were working for us that was doing a lot of the work because we, we actually, it looked like we were very successful. It appeared that we were making a lot of money because we were selling to about 400 stores, mostly small, like surf shops and beach stores. And about six months after I had quit my job and I was really trying to figure out the financial aspect of things. And I didn't have any financial training more specifically how to look at, okay, you've got this much money coming in, you've got this much money coming out and this is your profit. Like I just, didn't really understand that stuff. And I realized that it seemed like we were losing money, but we had all this money coming in and I was confused by that. So I went and met with a financial advisor at the small, there's like a, you can go to these free advisors. I forget what it's called. I think it's called the SBA, Small Business Administration. Mm. And you can meet with an expert and for free, they'll look at your financials and they'll give you their opinion. Now, mind you, this was six months after I quit my job, right? Mm -hmm. And I go meet with this guy and I said, you know, this is what my husband and I want to do with our business. We want to grow. Here's our financials. He looked at our profit and loss statements. He looked at all the documents and he said, 
Mrs. Brophy, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you and your husband are losing money hand over fist, and you two really need to go get real jobs. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Ouch. Do you know what I did? I came home and I cried. Cried my eyes out. Drew was like, I can't believe it. What the hell did this guy say to you? And I said, he told me we need to go get jobs. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we weren't going to go get jobs. We were committed. And, and you know what we did? We learned real fast how to stop losing money because we had to. Where were you losing money? Like, where were the holes? Okay, the biggest hole was selling T-shirts to stores. So whenever... <laughs> that was where we lost the most money because getting t-shirts made on a larger scale mm-hmm. is actually very expensive and it's really hard to track your inventory with your sizes and then to get the stores everything they need. And even though we had almost, you know, close to 400 stores that were buying from us, we were losing money. We were losing money. We weren't making a profit. The cost of the products and the employees and the warehouse was more than the business could pay. And we've realized, number one, we're not good at wholesaling. We suck at it. Number two, we're not good people managers. We suck at that. I had to fire my own sister. That's a whole other story. But <laughs> <laughs> How's Thanksgiving been since then? <laughs> you know, my mom, my mom was mad. But my sister called me like a week later and said, I don't blame you. It would have fired me too. <laughs> <laughs> she she actually admitted she was not doing a good job. So it's all good. This was years ago. We're all past it now. <laughs> but, but, you know, you, I had to make some really hard decisions. Yeah. And the hardest decision was we decided we were going to cut out selling wholesale completely. That was a hard decision because... Number one, it made us look really bad because you had to admit you failed. Oh, no. (laughs) You know, like I had to write a letter to every store that had been buying from us. And I said, you know, I didn't say we failed, but I said, we've decided to shut down our wholesale division. We appreciate your business all these years. Thank you very much. You know, we got rid of our employees. We got rid of the big warehouse, moved into a tiny little studio and it was almost, it was like we started all over again. Yeah. We had to re- recalibrate. We lost our asses, basically. And it was a good lesson because it made us smarter. And then it just made us pay attention to the details, which we weren't doing. Right. What I'm hearing that's, that's really key in that is just knowing what your numbers are and knowing where you're making advances and where you're hemorrhaging for lack of a better term. So, even, yeah. you know, and it's, if it comes down to maybe vanity is not the right word, but your ego and in, in saying like, Oh, gosh, well, I'm going to disappoint these people, or I'm going to look stupid if I do this. It would have been so much worse if you just said, Oh, no, I can't because I'm afraid of what people are will think. And two years later, you've, you've got this hose of money flowing out the back door, that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then we end up losing, you know, everything. You know, what, one thing I've gotten in the habit of doing is asking myself when I'm, when I'm really faced with a hard business decision, mm-hmm. I ask myself, what would Richard Branson do? <laughs> I really do because I love Richard Branson. Richard Branson owns Virgin Atlantic Airlines, Virgin Records, a million other businesses, but he's also a fun guy. He knows how to have fun and he's, I mean, I've never met him, but boy, would I love to. But I do, I think, okay, Richard Branson doesn't make business decisions based on ego Mm -hmm. or based on what people are going to think or based on it anything like that. He makes a business decision based on what is going to grow the business. And if this isn't going to grow it, is it going to benefit in some other way? And if not, then I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's also very clear on his philosophy as the owner of all these businesses. And by that, I mean, for Virgin Airlines, as just as one example, how how people should treat their customers and what's acceptable and what's not both on the side of the customers and 
his employees. So he's got these very, very clear, defined rules, I guess, of how he makes his decisions so that it's not about ego. It's not about emotion. It's not about anything else. It's He's decided in advance, these are my markers. These are my priorities, let's say. These are my values. And yes or no depends on does it honor all of these aspects. Yeah. And that leads into something else. You know, I've just gotten a lot better about protecting our time. Because Drew and I have goals, we're always setting goals and reaching them and then setting new ones. And we're we're really pushing ourselves to set bigger and bigger goals. But to reach a really big goal, whether it's a big money goal or a big achievement goal, it takes time and you have to have focused time. Mm -hmm. And it's real easy to get derailed Mm -hmm. by other people. And, And a lot of times it's really good stuff. Like just recently, I was really proud of myself. I made a really, Drew and I made a really tough decision. We were both asked to speak at Eddie Vedder's Ohana Fest. And Eddie Vedder, he actually is was one of our clients a year ago. He commissioned Drew to do a painting. He's the, you know, he he's with the band Pearl Jam. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we're a huge fan of his. And so it was the biggest honor for him like to that. commission a, a piece of art from Drew last year. And this year, his people contacted us and asked us to be a part of this concert in addition to the music they were having speakers and it's literally six miles from our house and it would have been so great. And at first I said, yes, because I mean, how do you say no to that? Yeah. (laughs) But then a couple of days later, I thought, oh my gosh, we have these few big things we're working on right now. And I thought, I I realized that we couldn't pile one more thing on. Mm -hmm. And I agonized over it. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't, I mean, like it's such an honor to be invited to do this. But at the same time, if I do, it's going to pull us off of the things that we're working on that we've committed to Mm -hmm. for the big picture of what we want. So in the end, I called and I said, look, Drew and I are so flattered that you asked. And I hope you'll ask us again in the future, but we just can't do it because we've got these other things. And I don't feel like I can do one more thing and then do everything well. Right, right. That's so important. That must have been so hard because that that would that would have been. For me, that would have been just like, oh, my God, Eddie Vedder. But the more important question is that you, Andrew, asked yourself is what's the opportunity cost? What are we giving up? And what are we doing kind of half-assed, for (laughs) for lack of a better term? You know, if we say yes to, to this, then we're putting ourselves in a position where we can't deliver what we know is our best work. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, and in the past... I would say yes to everything and then just be so stressed out and then do everything half-assed and, and make myself sick and make Drew sick. And, you know, I just, I want to keep my eye on the, on the big picture now. And I'm really, you know, it takes so much self-discipline to do that, but Mm -hmm. that is what, that is what the highly successful people are doing to manage their time and their goals. And so, I'm following their lead. Yeah, I think no is the most important word that artists need to relearn. I mean, we all learned it as two year olds <laughs> that we said no to everything, right? And then somewhere along the line, we didn't want to, we just either it's the fear of missing out or the fear of disappointing people or not knowing your own priorities. And I think a lot of artists suffer for not being able to say no to opportunities, even when it's any better. Yeah. And the other thing is say no to things that you really don't want to do. Like, I am sure this has happened to you and probably everybody listening at least once where somebody says, oh my gosh, I love your art so much. And, you know, my grandmother just died last week. And, you know, I know you love my grandmother because we're, we've been friends since high school and can you please do this piece of art for me that would commemorate my grandmother? And, you know, I mean, how do you say no to that? It's so hard. But then what happens is, you know, I'm just using that as an example, but I, it's something that's so important to this other person, but it's going to derail you because what they're asking you to do is maybe not in your wheelhouse. Maybe they're asking you to do a portrait and you don't do portraits. Mm -hmm. So doing it in the first place would be incredibly painful 
and you'd probably procrastinate for months and months. And while you're procrastinating, even if you're not working on it, it's tugging on you. It's pulling on your brain. It's adding to the drain of your energy, just having this unfinished thing that you don't want to do. So those are the things that you really need to say no to. And, you know, I coach artists. I had this one artist I was helping, and this was a scenario that was happening to her, a very similar story. And she said, and I already told them I'd do it, and it's been sitting here, you know, I haven't touched it in like six weeks, and it's I'm losing sleep over it. And I said, I said, here's what you need to do. Call them and say, look, I don't do portraits, and I really wanted to do this for you, and that's why I said yes. But I realized that I can't do it. I'm not going to do the best job for you. But here's someone else that I recommend. I know this other artist that will do exactly what you want them to do, and they'll do a terrific job. And I'm so sorry that I said yes in the first place, and I hope you understand. Yeah, yeah. What's your recommendation for avoiding that scenario in the first place? The example that you gave, obviously, you were making a point. So you're making it extremely emotional. We've known each other forever. And you've known my grandmother. And you know, I can hear the violins. And I can see the tears in their eyes. (laughs) So how do you recommend just sort of nipping that in the bud while preserving your friendship? From the very beginning, from that first conversation, if you aren't so excited about doing it, (laughs) from that first conversation, you just say, you know what, I know this is important to you, but I can't do it. My plate is full and I'm not the best person to do that kind of art anyway. I really would like to recommend that you have somebody else do it. There's a lot of other artists and maybe, and you know, recommend someone else or, or offer to find someone for them. But really, you just have to say no. Mm -hmm. You have to say no. Doing things for friends anyway always has a weird thing to it anyway. That's a whole other thing because you don't want to charge your friends or you're going to charge them very little. And now that is taking you away from earning your income potential for that week or that month. You know, it would be like if you had a real job and then your friend says, can you do this for me? And you have to take an unpaid week off of your real job to do it. Just don't do it. Right. Even if you love their grandmother, even if their child's dying of cancer, even if like no matter what the tragic story is, unless it's in your real house of mastery and you really want to do it and you have the time to do it, don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's so I think the underlying issue in that you brought up a really good point when you sort of make that that comparison, which is real that this for yourself, you don't necessarily have to explain this to the person, but be clear in your head that when you're saying yes, what you're actually saying is, I'm going to take a week off of work to do this for for this person. Sometimes, like you said, you may be so close to that person. And it's something that you do and you want to help you want to do this for their family, fine. But when you have that resistance, or when you know, like, this is just going to turn into a train wreck, I think part of the reason that, you know, there's the reasons we say yes when we don't want to is number one, we feel guilty in that scenario when it's a friend. And number two, you're not really respecting yourself as an artist. You're not really understanding that for me, what I'm thinking about, if I put myself in that position, if I just imagine what that would be like and what I might be thinking, I'm also thinking I'm going to take a week off of work to do this for this person as an artist, we don't get paid vacation, (laughs) you know, either. So I'm actually choosing to instead of going on vacation with my husband later on in the year, I'm using that time now. So I'm really clear about what it is I'm giving up and what it is that my time is valuable. And what that means to me and what the consequences of that for me are. And so I'm clear on that. And I have enough respect for myself and my my time that I'm going to, I'm going to say no. But I think when you're not clear about what, you know, like you might just think like, okay, it's just a painting, I'll do it, you know, okay, it's a, I'll squeeze it in somewhere. When you're squeezing it in, you're taking it away from another place. You absolutely are. And then, you know, if you have children, I mean, not everybody out there listening has children, but once you have children, that really changes the game because now you're choosing 
this other person over your children because now you have to work longer hours. And that's what I always like. I, I have people come in all the time and come into our studio and want Drew to like teach their kids. And I always say, well, we, we can set up consulting. Like they want him to do it for free. Mm -hmm. And I explain to them once he's finished his work for the day, he's going home to his children. However, if you want to set, you know, if you want to block out a work time in his work day, we can do that. It's going to cost you X amount of dollars. Here's the thing. If you don't respect your time, how can anyone else respect your time? And it's not just that they're disrespecting you on purpose because they really don't know. It's not their fault. It's, no. it's up to you to train people. You have to train people. You have to train everyone in your life, whether they're a client, a family member, a friend, you train them how to look at you. They're either going to see you as a professional artist or they're going to see you as someone playing around with a hobby. Mm -hmm. And a professional artist has to protect their time. I had a friend, a, a dear friend of mine that I do a lot of hiking with. And I, I'm sure he's not going to be listening to this, so I can talk about this. <laughs> he, Nobody's listening. He's not an artist. He wouldn't be listening to this podcast. He's retired. But he's a dear friend. I love him so much. And he works for a local charity. And so he called me up one day and he said, look, I have this great opportunity for Drew. We want Drew to create this illustration for this music festival we're putting on and there's going to be all these famous musicians and so forth. It'll be great. And I said, okay, so tell me what you need. Well, we need, you know, what he wanted illustrations for t-shirts and signage and banners. So it's a good three weeks worth of work is what I figured out. So I said, look, I'll put together a price quote and I'll email it to you. And he said, oh, oh, I thought maybe Drew would just do it for free because, because I know he really cares about this charity. And I said, he does care about the charity, he cares a lot. So I'll give you guys a discount. You know, and then I'm, it's this awkward moment. And I'm thinking, OK, how do I help him understand? And then it came to me. I said, look, so his, his wife is a teacher. He's retired, but, but she's a teacher. And I said, look, it would be like this. It would be like you asking your wife to take a three week unpaid vacation to go teach some kids. She doesn't know very well, just out of the kindness of her heart. A three-week unpaid leave of absence. And then he, he said to me, oh, my gosh, I never looked at it that way. I never thought of it in terms of you losing three weeks of pay. And I said, well, good, I'm glad you can understand that now. And so I gave him a price quote. I gave him you know, a little bit of a discount. And we ended up, worked out great. They paid us and, and all was good. But... But those are the conversations I find myself having with people almost weekly. Yeah. I don't know if it's how other people see artists or how artists have trained people to see them, but that is a huge, huge, or, you know, it's probably realistically, it's probably a combination of both, but it's such a huge issue. I mean, I had Coca-Cola wanted me to do a mural for exposure and, and it's not like they're they're not hurting for money. <laughs> I'll tell you what. We just did a project for one of their companies. I mean, they own a lot of companies. Yeah. They have so much money. It's crazy. Of course for they marketing. do. Yeah. Phenomenal. I'm surprised. It must have been like a uh, one of the, was it like them directly or a company that? It was in Argentina. So it was, you know, a representative of a representative. So, Yeah. <laughs> So here's what I'll tell you what was going to happen with that. They were going to get paid and you were going to do it for free. They were going to get paid for your work. That's, that's what was going down there. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, you know, I said, uh, no, <laughs> thank you. That was very nice of you to ask, but no. Well, yeah, who knows? And I don't want to disrespect Coca-Cola. I don't know how they normally work. So that, that could have been a one-off or it could have been a pattern. I have no idea. Yeah. I mean, I get so many wacky things like that from big companies and little companies and all kinds of companies. Yeah. And it could be just somebody, one person in that company testing the waters and just saying like, can I get away with this? Well, I think what it was, was an agency because they have all these agencies that are not Coca-Cola, but that's, that handle things for Coca-Cola. Yes. So, so the agency was 
going to charge Coca-Cola and have you do it for free. So the agency gets paid for your free work. That's what I think was happening. That sounds more likely. Yeah, because I I worked with one of Coca-Cola's marketing agents in out of Mexico. And anyway, yes, I I have I got just recently, and so I got a little bit of insight into how all that stuff works. But I'm sure they got somebody to do it for free. Yeah, or they just didn't do it. Who knows? Or they got a budget for it. Who knows? I do want to talk about something that I know is a burning question with a lot of artists. And that is how to price your work. Yeah, that's a fun one. Let's talk about that. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. So hard. (laughs) Okay. Well, in general, you can price your work for whatever market you decide you want to sell your work in. And obviously, you're not going to sell $10,000 paintings if they're crappy paintings. But there are artists selling $10,000 paintings for $500 because they choose to sell their work in a lower price market. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that at all if that's what you want. There's no judgment here. It really goes back to that thing, what do you want? And there are artists that say, you know, I want to see my work in the homes of celebrities. Mm -hmm. And I I want my work to sell for 30,000 plus. And I mean, you don't start right out the gate with that. But if you have that vision, everything you do will be in alignment with that vision. So let's say you are just, you know, getting your art business started. And I say business because it's really a business when you don't work for someone else and you work for yourself. So let's say you're just getting your art business started and you've been painting for a few years. Well, to get to that $30,000 painting price, you have a few years of honing your your mastery. Mm -hmm. And, And while you're doing that, you're building up your fan base, your collector base. You're working up to it. Yeah. You know, something I've observed is... Just the fact that a lot of, and this can be art, this could be anything, but a lot of people don't understand or don't think about what what their positioning is, let's put it that way. Meaning, you can be the type of artist who sells five paintings a year at, you know, $20,000 or $30,000. So you're positioning yourself as an artist who is selling at a much higher price range to a very particular market. And that market is going to be very, very small. So your skill set has to, of course, be worth that amount of money. And you have to understand that that's, that's where you're selling your work, or you can sell your work to a lot of people for a lot less money. And you still need to have a high skill set but maybe you paint faster and you're, you know, like you're, you're totally comfortable with, with your price range, but it's the, it's understanding the positioning of it. And I think a good example is sort of with restaurants. If you have like a super high end restaurant in New York city that only has six tables and they create these jewels of dishes for you, (laughs) you're getting an experience, you're getting the environment, you're getting a lot of other things versus my favorite restaurant in the world, which would be in and out Burger, where I'm going to, you know, <laughs> pay $3. <laughs> and I'm really happy with my with my purchase. So it's not that one is better than the other. It's understanding that if you go to in and out Burger, you will not have that same experience that you would have at the posh New York restaurant. And if you go to the posh New York restaurant, you are getting that experience and you're not going to pay $3 for anything. Exactly. And I love the way you put that position yourself. And it really got me thinking, if you want to position yourself as a high value artist, that's just a phrase I like to use, a high value provider, high value artist, somebody who's selling paintings over $10,000 you better be a good communicator. And if you're not a good communicator, learn, you can learn to be a good communicator. Mm -hmm. Learn to speak to people properly. Learn to learn to speak to people. And some people can't talk. I don't know. You know, they just, they need to work on that. Mm -hmm. Learn how to 
write better communications, describe your work. Your website should look like that of someone who's selling $10,000 paintings. Professionalism, professional photos. If you're selling high-end paintings, you should have professional photo shoots of you at least a couple times a year where you hire a photographer to come in and get shots of you working. And those are used in your marketing materials, on your website and so forth. You know, if you have a studio, then you want high value clients to pull up in their Tesla and walk in and buy something. Don't have art on the floor. You know, that's my biggest pet peeve is seeing artwork on the floor. High end paintings. It should never be on the floor. Put it on easels or hang it on the wall. I mean, these are little things, but every little thing is a part of that positioning yourself. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, you know, again, and I'm, I'm just using the restaurant analogy because it's easier for people to understand, but it translates really well. If you go into a diner, you're expecting a certain experience. You, Of course, you want the waiter to be nice to you. Of course, you want the hostess to greet you. You And if the owner comes out and she says hello to you, awesome, but you're not really expecting it. And if there's a tear in the vinyl of the, the booth, you know, whatever, you're paying X amount for your meal and for your experience. But if I go into that posh New York restaurant and the... <laughs> and the seating is torn, or the hostess doesn't have her shirt tucked in, these tiny little details that don't matter at uh, in and out or, you know, somewhere else, in that context, they matter a lot. Yeah. And, th and that's, it's all about that experience that you're talking about. It's all about that, that presentation. So if you're not going for that high end market, then you don't have to worry about that as much because the expectation's not there. But you can't go into that market you can't go to a cocktail party in your painting clothes. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's another thing. It's dressing, you know, a certain way. In the past couple of years, Drew and I have decided, you know, to really step up our professionalism. And we used to always go to the studio in shorts and flip flops because we live at the beach. And there's been a lot of times where I've gone straight from the beach and I'm in my bikini and a, and a cover up, you know, and it's wet because I just got out of the water. We don't do that anymore. We are positioning ourselves for higher value clients. And so now I'll put on a dress and cute shoes and Drew is now not rarely wears t-shirts anymore. Now he wears button down shirts. It's just, a, it's a subtle difference, but it's really just us trying to step it up. Mm -hmm. I envision we're, we actually are just moving into a new studio this week. We get the keys. Oh, how exciting. Oh my gosh. It's so exciting. It's, we have our own parking lot and I visual, I envision Tesla's parked in the parking lot because I love Tesla's and I totally envision that. Now, I don't know how I'm going to do that. I envision having like a Tesla sponsored art show or art exhibit and I have this vision in my mind of having this art exhibit and a parking lot full of Teslas. That's my next goal. <laughs> mm, interesting. So I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which I think is always, this is what I at least perceive. This is what I hear as one of the biggest fears of artists, which is how to sell your art without selling out. Where is that line or how do you... How do you talk about that? Because it's really, it's a mindset issue in some ways. It's such, a, it's such a mindset. And I don't understand the resistance to selling your work or, or taking the steps to sell it is what's going to kill you. So you have to overcome it. It's something you have to learn how to do. You have to say, okay, maybe I'm uncomfortable selling my work, but I'm willing to learn a few strategies and tips so that I can get better at it. Mm -hmm. And if that's all you do is to say, I'm willing, then you're opening the door to actually doing it. One way to shift that mindset from feeling weird about selling your art is to realize that your art, no matter what you do, whether you're painting, sculpting, or you're doing illustrations for companies, graphic art for companies, whatever it is, your art is important to someone. They need it. And the more they need it, 
the more valuable it is and the more you're giving. So you're creating this art. And yes, while you're asking for money in exchange for the art, you're providing something wonderful to someone, whether it's a piece of art that they absolutely love that brings them joy every day, or if it's a company that you're providing art for and it solves a business problem for them. So you really have to look at it as you're contributing to someone. Mm -hmm. And in exchange for that contribution, they're giving you love back in the form of money. And that money enables you to keep doing what you're doing. So if you can, if you can make that mental shift, then it's, then the next step is to learn a few tricks and tips to sell things. And, and there's a few things that are so simple that artists aren't doing and it's a big mistake. And just one is following up. <laughs> I mean, it's so simple, but people don't do it. They don't. Right? I know. I know. And I write about this a lot in my book and not just following up. I write a lot about sales techniques, but this is one thing that's easy. Somebody shows interest either by email, phone call, or in person. You make sure you get their information. And if they don't buy at that moment, say, well, you know, can I, I'm going to follow up with you. And follow up with them in 24 hours, 48 hours. I mean, don't wait any longer than that. And don't stop following up until they either say yes or they say no. Mm -hmm. If they didn't say no, then you're not finished. You're not finished. If you have to call them every month for six months, that's okay. You're forming a relationship. I know that sounds a little crazy, but I've actually done that with people. Like there are people who want to buy, but then life gets in the way. Mm -hmm. I had this one guy that uh, literally a year ago, he wanted to buy this painting from Drew and he was all set. We, We actually had a meeting set. We were meeting at his office. And I didn't know where his office was. And so the day before I texted him and said, hey, send me your, your address. Silence. Never heard from the guy again. But I didn't give up. I texted him like once a month. I emailed him once a month. And I was like, hey, you know, I don't know what happened. And I just pretended like everything was okay, right? Mm-hmm. But I never heard from the guy again until, I want to say it was yeah, six, seven months later, he emailed me. And he said, I am so sorry. I just went silent because I had a close family member die and it wrecked my world and I couldn't talk to anyone. And I'm so sorry. Can we, can we try this again? And so now I've got a painting commission from him. Mm -hmm. I just didn't give up. And it wasn't that I was harassing him. I just sent him a little message here and there. Hey, I'm still here if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I think the important thing is to, develop that mindset of you're developing a relationship with a person. So of course, you're not going to email or text or contact them with the tone of, hey, you jerk, you were supposed to be here and you're not and you're not respected. (laughs) You know, like nobody, I'm pretty sure none of my listeners would like by now, you know, you guys don't ever do that, right? And you never would. That's just not in your personality. So because you're not doing that, and because you're being respectful of them, and if you think of it as developing a relationship, it's a completely different mindset than, oh, I'm bugging him. Oh, I shouldn't do this. Oh, I should, you know, like, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't contact that person because obviously I'm annoying them. What you're, re- unless they've told you no and stop emailing me, <laughs> right? you know, yeah. then behaving as if everything is okay. And just, you know, a friendly, hey, how's it going every now and again, I think is, is completely appropriate. And yeah, in my experience as well, it's been... Most of the time you get, hey, thanks for following up with me because I, you know, X, Y, Z happened or, you know, like all this people have lives. <laughs> and when we're contacting a collector or when an artist is interacting with anybody who they feel like has some, I don't know if authority is the right word, but is going to have some impact on their financial situation or is going to buy a work, all of a sudden artists become like these, hi, sorry, I don't want to bother you, but blah, 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 blah. And that's part of learning to have those conversations and learning to be comfortable with with that is part of becoming a professional artist. And when I'm saying, you know, professional, it's just valuing yourself, your work, your time, and understanding that you do have value. (laughs) 
and showing that in your communications, I think is is really important. And it also signals to the other person that yeah, this is this is somebody that I want to interact with. Yeah, you know, and the other thing is, it's because you're the one selling something, it's your responsibility to do all the work. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the work is following up. And to me, that's actually good customer service, because Mm -hmm. you're taking control, taking the bull by the horns and following up because people are busy and people do forget about you if you let them. So you have to kind of not let them forget about you. So just to wrap it up, I would love to hear from you. What are some of the habits that you think artists need to have in order to run a successful studio practice? First, most important habit is take time every morning, preferably every day to plan your day, plan your week, plan your month, plan your year. Take time to think about what you're doing. Sort of like planning a trip across the ocean. You got to think about what you're doing. Otherwise, what everybody else wants is going to pull you off course. And that's that alone. If that was the only thing you changed today, you would see massive increase in results. Mm-hmm. If you did that every single day, start every day with that. The other thing is be gentle on yourself. If you're not good at sales, that's okay. You can learn to be good at sales if you try. If you are not where you want to be, but you have a vision of where you want to be, keep that vision and keep moving towards it. Every single day, every decision you make either brings you closer to it or further from it. Mm -hmm. And that's really what you have to think about. And so if you get a call from someone that says, hey, I want you to do this or that, think to yourself, does this take me closer to my goals or further from my goals? Fantastic. Maria, thank you so much for for spending this time with me and sharing all this information with Savvy Painter listeners. If they want to get into contact with you, where do they go? They can go to mariabrophy.com. That's my website. It's a blog. There's a lot of good stuff to read on there. And also people can follow me on Instagram. And I post a lot of informational things on Instagram. And that's just my name too, Maria Brophy. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been fun. Thank you again to Maria for being a part of this interview series and for sharing so much with the Savvy Painter community. You can find show notes for this episode, how to connect with Maria and links to her book at SavvyPainter.com. Savvy Painter, Gamblin, Artist Colors and Trakel Art Supplies are teaming up together to do our first online art competition. Artist Carol Marine will be jurying the show. You might remember that Carol was a guest on the Savvy Painter. She's a painter herself and the founder of DailyPaintWorks.com. First place winner will receive $500 in merchandise from both Gamblin and Trakel, plus a cash prize of $250, but that's not all. The first place winner will also be a guest on the Savvy Painter podcast. So if you win first prize, you get your work in front of tens of thousands of people, a thousand dollars worth of art supplies to paint to your heart's content and some cold hard cash. Entries are being accepted from now until October 29th, 2017. Go to SavvyPainter.com and click on the Call to Entries tab for more information. I can't wait to see the great work that you submit. Good luck. And lastly, I'd like to take a moment to thank some of you who support the podcast. The Savvy Painter podcast is made possible in part by listeners like you. So a big shout out and much gratitude to Christine Rasmussen, Barbara Chantre, Pat Oxley, Kathy Elliott, Jill Opelka, Kathleen Speranza, ZB Gallery, Ed Penniman, Andy Doby, Wright Design, Kevin Eldritch, Jasmine Alger, and Srivana Nara. Until next week, this is Antrice Wood with the Savvy Painter Podcast. Thank you so much for listening.